Good morning, Christ Church. Welcome. We are so glad you're with us today. My name is Melissa, coming to you from our Mandarin campus here in the atrium. I've got my friend Raven with me. Hey, yeah, I'm Raven. I'm on our production team here at Mandarin as well. And I just wanted to give a warm welcome to all of our first time guests. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your Sunday with us. Uh, if you are here in person, I would love for you to take your phone out and there's gonna be a little tag in the seat in front of you. Go ahead and tap it with your phone, fill out the survey, and then come to our atrium for a free gift. Absolutely. Um, if you're online, no worries, we did not forget about yeah. you. There should be a link in the chat as well so you can sign up the same way. Yeah, if you're watching online, say hello to Tom. He's in our chat ready to welcome you here today. And gosh, it's a, it's a holiday weekend. Happy yeah. Labor Day weekend. Happy right. Labor Day. We've made it, I feel we like. We did. We it's made it to September. beginning of fall. Maybe. Is it going to get cooler here? I, I sure know. hope so. I hope so. Yeah, what have you got planned for Labor Day? What have you been doing? Oh, uh, well, you know, I did my Labor Day a little early. I <laughs> went to Disney and it was buckets of fun. So. Oh, I bet. That sounds great. Well, to me, Labor Day is all about football. Yeah. yeah, college Absolutely. football. And I have on red and black today, so you can tell me you know, what my team is. We know where you're from. Yes, exactly. It was a great day. We got some more football games going on, but we're glad that you're here with us today. And then you can get ready you know, for the football a little bit later. But we yeah. do hope you have a great Monday off, whatever yes. you're doing tomorrow. So actually, speaking of Monday, I hope you have your Monday nights clear because yep. we have a Monday night service every Monday at 6.30, yep. including this Monday even though it's a holiday. I yeah. think it is a little bit more of an intimate setting. I really enjoy it. It's a great way to kind of, you know, you always have those frazzling Mondays and it's a great way to kind of reset right after. Absolutely. Well, we'd love to see you this Monday night as well. And we'd love to see you at so many things happening around Christchurch. Yeah. We plan events so that you can invite your friends to come and join us and check out Christchurch other than just on a Sunday. And we've got a cool event coming up for our men in the room. We've got some fancy cars. Oh yeah, we've got some food, some cars, some motorcycles. Yep. Coming up on September 14th, Man Cave. We'd love for you to be there. Great opportunities to hang out together as guys. Um, and you can find all those details on our, our events page. And you can get there by just taking your phone out and tapping the tag on the chair behind you, or, or in front of you, I should say. Or you can go onto our website. We would love to see you at one of those events. I want to say thank you to all of you who are so generous to Christchurch. Events where we can bring our friends and families to come check out Christchurch. All that happens because of your generosity, your faithfulness and giving to the, the work that God is doing here. We saw a baptism last service, which is like the best, the best thing. The it's best always thing. so wonderful yes. to just see the Holy Spirit moving. Absolutely. So God is using your generosity to literally change lives. And we are so grateful. If you'd like to give today, you can do so by... Again, tapping the tag with your phone. You can also give online or you can give through the giving boxes around the church. If you are new here or you're maybe just watching us for the first time online, no obligation to give. We are just glad that you are with us today. Absolutely. Yeah. And speaking of being with us today, we are partaking in communion later on today. Uh, so if you are in person, go ahead and go through those tunnels and get a communion kit. If you are online, I would love for you to grab some bread or crackers, juice, whatever you have and join us. I think it's a wonderful time just to remember what Jesus did for us on that cross. Absolutely. And speaking of service, it's about that time. It is. We're going to start with some singing and then we are continuing our stress fracture service series all about relationships today it's all about family yeah yes. absolutely it's a good one yes and you're going to meet somebody new on our staff pastor greg is here to communicate with us and and to speak with us today um so we're excited about that as well so as the band comes out we'd love for you if you're in the worship center go ahead and stand to your feet say hi to someone around you if you are watching online say hi in the chat let's get ready to worship together
morning, everyone. Come on, let's stand to our feet. So happy to have you with us this morning. Come on, we're gonna worship the Father together. Lead my heart to deeper waters. Lead my faith beyond the shallows of my feet to comfort. Dare my trust into all your greatness. Some place wilder than the safety of these old familiar shores. I know there's so much more I'm desperate to explore All the grace beyond these shores Teach my soul not to fear the darkness Teach my heart to fully lean on your cross for comfort Bind my step to your steadfast promise let my faith run like lightning on the lamplight of your word Cause I know there's so much more And I'm desperate to explore Of the grace beyond these shores I've got the hope of heaven running through my bones And the blood
invitation to let it all go. I see it now. I'm laying it down. All I know that I need you. So I run to the Father. I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again. Son for redemption, the price for my heart. I don't have the context for that kind of love. I don't understand, I can't comprehend. Father, uh, there was a declaration that you made through Jesus that wherever two or more are gathered, there you are in our midst. Lord, I don't think we fully comprehend, understand what that really feels like until we're together like this. When we're singing full-hearted uh, in our worship, when we're just sitting here receiving your word, Lord, that you're present and that you are doing things in our lives and you're revealing things that maybe we've never even considered before. Truths that would just, uh, would change the trajectory, uh, the trajectory of our life and where we're moving forward. Lord, we're, we're humbled by that reality and so grateful 
to be included in your community. Thank you so much for that. And as we move forward here today in our worship, it's our prayer that you would speak to us, that you'll help us understand more and more what it looks like to be a disciple, to allow that truth to transform our behavior and our thinking. And Lord, that it would set us on a course, living our life obediently and faithful for you. So speak to us today, do some amazing things. And uh, through all this, may you receive honor and glory that's certainly due your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you all, please be seated. I'm Todd, one of your pastors. Thank you for that kind you know, response back. Heckling, I think maybe is what it could be called. But hey, uh, listen, I wanna take a moment, welcome those of you who are with us first time, for the very first time. Maybe first time in a long time, welcome. It's good to have you with us today. And all the familiar faces that we see out here, man, we love seeing you week after week. And we're just knowing the way that the Lord works that today he's got something special for everyone. But one of the great joys of not just being online and watching is being together in community is that there's that other element of relationship. And we are about relationships and connectivity. And I, right now, I just want to draw your attention to that little thing on the front of your a tag that's on the front of your chair there. If you'll take your phone, you'll just tap it. It'll open up a series of prompts for you on, on how to uh, learn more about Christ Church. Uh, for those of you who are regulars around here, a place for you to submit your prayer request or go ahead and enable your stewardship at that point. Thank you very much for that, by the way. Uh, there's just a host of things to do, and that's the most technical part of that. But once you do that, you'll start connecting with some human beings. And uh, we just love for you to experience the joy what many of us enjoy here at Christ Church, which is the relationship part of this. We're getting ready to head into God's Word, and I'm so excited for our speaker today. Uh, I don't think you've had a chance to meet him. He's only been here for a couple of weeks, uh, but some context. Uh, we knew some time back that uh, in order for Jason to lead at the level that he needs to lead in our ministry, we were going to have to find some bandwidth. I mean, you think about it, we've got three campuses here, three prison ministries. We have other ministries that we wanna open up here, near and far away. We want him to continue to teach. And he just needs more time for that. And, and if you also think about it, uh, our Fleming campus has a campus pastor. Uh, our River City campus has a campus pastor, but we don't really have somebody here that is seeing to the day-to-day -day operations of our ministry, a campus pastor for our Mandarin campus. And Lord has blessed us with a wonderful gentleman to help us with that journey. His name is Greg Ingram, he's married to Whitney, and um, he's a heavy hitter, people. Uh, he's been involved in ministries down with uh, Max Lucado in Texas, up in Willow Creek, uh, South Barrington, uh, Chicago land there, and for the past 10 years, he's been a church planner in Miami. Why do I mention all that? Because this guy understands the body of Christ. He understands that when there's just 10, 15 people, and he understands that when there's 15, 20, 30,000 people, he is a fantastic man. You're gonna love him. We happen to share offices right next to each other, so I kinda of feel like a big deal. I can just go over there anytime I want to, say hello to him. He says hello back to me. We got that going for us already. It's pretty cool. You're gonna enjoy knowing him. The, he's a great fellow. And I'll tell you what we're gonna do here. We're gonna watch a video uh, celebrating our, on our 50th year. And after that, as he comes in, I don't think it'd be too forward if we just gave him a really warm welcome, okay? So be prepared to do that. All right, let's watch this video. My name is Sophie Davis. I attend here at the Mandarin campus. My parents started going here a few years before I was born, so I have been raised here since I remember. I don't know a time in my life without Christ Church. So they made that decision to raise a family here. And then when I was 10 years old, I made the decision for myself to follow Jesus. And I, my dad baptized me here at the Mandarin campus. So through being in the nursery and then elementary and then middle school and high school programming, whether that was a Sunday morning or then throughout the week in student ministry, 
I was here anytime the doors were open. And then once I graduated and I turned 18, and it was no longer my parents bringing me to church, but me making the decision for myself, if I was gonna continue to do that, it just wasn't even a question. So continuing to stay involved through the young adults group, and being involved that way. And then throughout the years, just having amazing mentors, whether that was small group leaders, people on staff, or just other people that I had met through Christ Church, um, pouring into me and continuously leading me to Jesus um, on a Sunday morning and throughout the week. I eventually was approached about a job here at Christ Church and um, now I'm on staff and it has been just the greatest experience ever. Looking back at all my years here at Christ Church, Christ Church has just meant everything to me. It has given me my closest friends, my community that has become family. I have because of Christ Church. And I realized that it's not just a building. Christ Church is the people and the community that they've built here 50 years ago that now I'm getting to experience today. I am so thankful for all the people who have poured into my life over the past 21 years and the people who continue to pour into my life here. I'm so excited to see what God has in store for me and has in store for Christ Church over the next 50 years. All right, Sophie. We love Sophie. Now, as Todd said, my name is Greg, and I am the new campus pastor here at Miami Church. And I have three kids, 12, 10, and 8. And if anything you know, if you know about school, it started, and I see you students, I see you, right? And there's been something going around the schools. Yes? A lot of sickness. And guess what? I got it. I couldn't talk yesterday. I said under 100 words, and so this is my voice today. I am sorry. Can you give me extra grace today, please? Thank you, I'm gonna need help. <clears throat> if at any point my voice just gives out, we'll just start praying. That's all I got. So I'm gonna give you everything I got with the voice that I have left. I'm sorry it sounds like this, but, but I've been a reader, I'm a reader, and I've been reading this book. Has anyone read this book? It's called uh, Spare. Hi, Prince Harry. Yeah, okay, great. Good lead readers. Okay, good, good thing 930 reads. 11 readers, right? Well, this book, uh, thank you, St. John's Public Library System. This book is, is Prince Harry telling his story. And here's a guy, he's a prince. He lives in a palace. He's got a nanny for his nanny. I mean, this guy, if you think about privilege, he's got it in spades. He's got any and everything you could ever want. But yet, as I'm reading his story, my primary emotion is sadness. His story, it's heartbreaking. I mean, how can someone that literally has everything, all the money you could ever want, all the privilege you could ever want, all of anything you could ever want, and yet you read the story and it's just full of heartbreak. And here's a family, there's so much dysfunction and so much unhealthiness and so much unlove and, and there's addiction to drugs and to alcohol and he keeps coming back to the fundamental questions that we all ask as humans. Who am I? Why am I here? What's the purpose? Now, I'm not here to pick on Prince Harry, I actually like the guy, we can grab a coffee sometime. But the truth is, if we're honest, Every single one of us that walked into the room this morning, right? We, as humans, right? We share a similarity in that there's a lot of brokenness and there's a lot of mess. And some of us limp through those doors, not physically limp through the door. We look good on the outside, but we came through the doors this way and our marriage is just holding on by a thread. Or maybe you came through that door and there's an addiction that you're battling and it's a secret addiction. You don't want anybody to know about it, but it's just kind of kicking you in the rear end over and over again or you're struggling, right? And the reality is that, that we are broken, flawed, messed up people. 
That's who we are. It's part of the human condition. If I'm just being honest, right? There there was a, a scene in my house this week by a little person. I won't name the name. But this little person behaved a certain way and I reacted to that behavior in a certain way. And if we were to put it up on the screen as a film and you were to watch it, I would be ashamed. I would be embarrassed. See, this is part of the human condition. And we've been in this conversation, if you've been with us, that we're walking through Genesis scene by scene, and we're calling the series Stress Factors. And we've been looking at this one particular guy for the last few weeks. Does anybody remember his name? Great. There's two white people on this side. Thank you. I'm just, I'm just going to look this way. <laughs> Jacob. Now, let's be honest. Jacob is a lousy human being. I mean, can you say that about someone in the Bible? Like, I don't like him. I mean, Jacob seems like a con man. Jacob is one of those guys that all Jacob cares about is Jacob. You know someone like that? Like Jacob's theme song is me, 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 me. And here is Jacob, and he's, he's a trickster, he's a con man, he's out to kind of just move everything in his direction. But the theme, as I'm reading through, as I'm studying, as I'm sitting in the story of Jacob, the theme is God continues to show up time and time again. I mean, isn't this kind of God's MO? I mean, some of you, you've walked with God maybe for years and decades, And it's almost like God's at his best when it's the mess is the biggest. It's like the more broken the situation, the more dysfunctional the situation, the more crazy the situation, it's like God is at his best. And I know for me, in in the moments in my life, the lowest points, the hardest points, the points that I'm ashamed of, the points that I'm embarrassed about. God has always been there. He's never left me. He's never forsaken me. He's never turned his back on me. God has always been present. He's always been with me. You think about it for yourself. If we were sitting down having coffee and I ask you, what's your lowest point in your life, in your story, What's your lowest point and where was God? See, God is a God of the mess. In fact, the apostle Paul put it this way in Romans chapter five, verse eight, he said this, but God showed his great love by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And this is the good news. This is what comes through the life and the story of Jacob. And so if you're tracking along, we're in Genesis chapter 29. So I encourage you to pull out your Bibles or your workbooks. Genesis chapter 29. If you were here last Sunday or if you watched it online, we looked at the first part of Genesis chapter 29. And we know that Jacob actually met someone who may actually be a lousier human being. He, his name was Laban and Jacob is a trickster, but he met a guy named Laban who tricked the trickster. And you'll remember last week that Jacob ended up with the wrong wife. Raise your hand if you ended up, just kidding, just kidding, (laughs) just kidding. Oh, it was nice knowing you guys enjoyed working at Christ Street. I'm kidding. He ended up with the wrong wife. He, he was drunk out of his mind, and he ended up with the wrong wife. And so we're already beginning this story in Genesis 29. This is not according to God's plan. This is not going the way that God intended. We looked several months ago back in Genesis chapter two, verse 24, you'll see on the screen, it says, this explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and he's joined to his wife and the two are united into one. And so the the story, right, God's plan is that a man, one man, one woman in a committed relationship. But here is Jacob, we're gonna see in 29, Jacob is married to four wives not God's plan. So let's pick up the story. If you have your Bibles, your workbook, Genesis chapter 29, and we're going to start in verse 31. Here's what the word of God says. It says, when the Lord saw that Leah 
was unloved, he enabled her to have children, but Rachel could not conceive, so Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, the Lord has noticed my misery, and now my husband has loved me. Now, context, okay? you remember this. Leah is the oldest sister. She is the one that is not supposed to be his wife. Rachel, the younger sister, the one that he loved, who he wanted to be his wife, is also his wife, but she's the younger sister. Verse 33. Leah, she, soon became pregnant again and gave birth to another son, and she named him Simeon. For she said, the Lord heard that I was unloved and he has given me another son. Verse 34. Then she became pregnant with a third for a third time and gave birth to another son and she named him Levi. Hold on to that. We'll get to that later in Genesis. Levi, the priestly line. For she said, surely this time my husband will feel affection for me since I have given him three sons. Verse 35. Once again. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to another son, and she named him Judah, for she said, now I will praise the Lord, and then she stopped having children. Now, put a bookmark there. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Flip the page, chapter 30, verse 1. It says, when Rachel saw that she wasn't having any children for Jacob. She became jealous of her sister and she pleaded with Jacob, give me children or I will die. Now, this is a, I wanna stop here for a minute. That word jealous just leaps off the page. Have you ever, you ever seen a family destroyed by jealousy? You ever seen a person Destroyed by jealousy. If you look closer at this word, right, this jealousy, the root word in the original language, which is originally written in Hebrew, the, the word means envious. Envy. When's the last time you used the word envy in a sentence? We don't use that word very much in our modern society, but, but envy is probably one of the ugliest, nastiest thing that's inside of you is inside of me. You know what envy looks like? Oh, we're getting real now. You know what envy looks like? Envy looks like this. When someone makes a mistake, when someone falls flat on their face, when, when someone does something wrong, my, my first response is, yes. That's ugly. I hate that about myself. See, envy, envy is one of the, the ugliest things in, in, in the human language, in the English language. Envy is that thing that causes you to compare your life to someone that they don't even know that you're comparing them to. Envy is that thing that causes you to compete with someone they don't even know that you're competing with. Envy is that thing that causes you to be arrogant when you think you're winning. And envy is that thing that causes you to be discouraged when you think you're losing. Here's how this plays out, 2023. Anybody here have uh, Instagram or Facebook? No, oh, yeah, well, come on. No, is anybody on it right now? <laughs> oh, yeah, I see you. If that glow is on your face, I'm gonna call you out. No, I'm kidding. Hey, here's how this works, right? You get your phone out, <clears throat> you're scrolling, right? And you're going like, oh, did you see those shoes? I need those shoes. Those are cool shoes. Does no one else does that? Oh, come on. Or, or you're looking at it and you're like, they went to vacation there? Did you see those pictures? Oh my goodness, that is so beautiful. Why does, and, then, and then for me, I, I see kids, right? People take pictures of their kids and they're all, their hair is combed and they're all dressed nicely and they look good. And I'm going, my kids never look like that. <laughs> And what happens in this digital age, what happens on Instagram and Facebook and these kind of things is it pours gasoline on the fire of envy and jealousy and there's just no win when it comes to comparison. And so here's Rachel. She's comparing her life. She's comparing herself to Leah. But, but envy, it doesn't work. 
You know why? Because if you compare yourself, there's always going to be someone that has more. I don't care who you are. There will always be someone who has more. There's always gonna be someone that's richer or skinnier or prettier or funnier or hipper or whatever. Or on the negative side, there's always gonna be someone that's bigger or poorer. And so comparison always leads to a dead end. And it causes us to crash into this really important question. Pay attention. Who or what am I going to use as my reference point to tell me I'm okay? Let me say that again without a cracked voice. Who or what am I going to use as a reference point to tell me that I'm okay? Because the truth is, every single one of us in this room, there is something or someone we use as a reference point. And the problem is, especially in this digital age, is that we compare our lives, we compare our stuff with someone else's highlight reel. And it's just not real, it's not reality. And it's why stress, anxiety, and depression are at an all-time high in human history. It's why my children will never get a smartphone until they're 30 years old. It's a dead end. And here's Rachel, she compares herself to her sister. Who or what am, am I gonna use, are you gonna use as your reference point to tell you that you're okay? Because if you pick the wrong thing, it destroys. It destroys families. It destroys relationships and friends. It will destroy you. Who or what are you gonna pick? Proverbs, the writer Proverbs said this in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. He says, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. James, the brother of Jesus, leader in the first church, James chapter three, verse 16. Here's what he says. He says, church, are you jealous? Are you concerned about getting ahead? He says this, then your life will be a mess and you will be doing all kinds of evil things. He says, if you let envy and jealousy and comparison control you, James, the brother of Jesus, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says, your life will be a mess and you will do evil things. And here's the hard truth. Behind envy is this notion that God somehow shortchanged you. It's that somehow God owes you. And we see it here in Rachel in Genesis 30. But here's the hard part about this. It's really easy to see it in you. It's hard to see it in myself. What you have is less important than what you do with what you have. Don't miss this. What you have is less important than what you do with what you have because at some point, every single one of us in this room, like Rachel, we're going to come crashing in to this idea of jealousy and envy. And, and we've got to take our cue from God who says, take your cue from the one who made you and loves you and redeem you and celebrate what God has given others and fully leverage what God has given you because what you have is less important than what you do with what God has given you. Verse two, chapter 30, verse two. Then Jacob became furious with Rachel. Am I God, he asked? He's the one who has kept you from having children. Then Rachel told him, take my maid, Bilhah, and sleep with her, and she will bear children for you, and through her I can have a family too. Well, here's a great idea. D-U-M-B. Does anybody remember this? This is not the first time this has happened in the Genesis account. In fact, this happened back in Genesis chapter 16. How did that work out? Horrible. Have any of you ever taken matters into your own hands? 
No, don't raise your hand, that's rhetorical. <laughs> right, you, you, you want something, you deserve something. I've earned it. Or maybe you, you're spiritual about it and you pray about it, but some reason God is slow to answer. Or, or maybe, maybe God's tardy. Or maybe even God says no. And then what is the natural human response at that point? Well, I'll just make it happen. I'll do it myself. I'll make my own luck. And what happens is we take that square peg and we start trying to beat it into that round hole. And how does that work out? Has it ever worked out well? In fact, some of you are in this room and you're, you're living with, your family's living with the consequences of you trying to make something happen. When you're trying to put it on your time in your way and not waiting for God's time. In fact, if you look really closely at what happened in Genesis chapter 16, we as a, as a society, we as a world, we as a human, we are still living with the consequences of that decision thousands of years later. taking matters in our own hands. Verse four, it says, Rachel gave her servant Bilhah to Jacob as a wife. He slept with her and Bilhah became pregnant and she presented him with a son. Verse six, Rachel named him Dan for she said, God has vindicated me. He has heard my request and given me a son. Verse seven, Bilhah became pregnant again and she gave Jacob a second son and Rachel, and Rachel named him Natalia. Natali. For she said, I have struggled hard with my sister and I am winning. Jealousy, envy, it's destroying this family and it's destroying her. Verse nine, meanwhile, Leah realized that she wasn't getting pregnant anymore. So she took her servant Zilpha, this is great, we're now we're up to four, and she gave her to Jacob as a wife. And so Zilpha presented him with a son and Leah named him Gad for she said, how fortunate am I? Verse 12, then Zilpha gave Jacob a second son and Leah named him Asher. For she said, what joy is mine. Now the other women will celebrate me. One day during the wheat harvest, verse 14, Reuben found some mandrakes growing in the field and he brought them to his mother Leah and Rachel begged Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But Leah angrily, angrily replied, wasn't it enough that you stole my husband? Now you wanna steal my son's mandrakes too? Rachel answered, I will let Jacob sleep with you tonight if you give me some of your mandrakes. This is weird. <laughs> I don't know about you, I was in Publix this week and I didn't see any mandrakes. Yeah. I looked hard, I asked the guy in produce, he said, no, we don't have mandrakes. Now what is a mandrake? A mandrake is this large, wrinkled leaf and small purple flower that has this root that can be several feet long. And, and in ancient culture, the belief was that mandrakes stimulated and helped with fertility and conception. So here is Rachel who is barren and she believes that these mandrakes are a way for her to bear children with Jacob. Weird. Verse 16. So that evening, Jacob's coming home from the fields. Leah went out to meet him and she says, you must come sleep with me tonight or I have paid for you. Weird. Okay, with some mandrakes that my son found so that night he slept with Leah and God answered Leah's prayers and she became pregnant again and gave birth to a fifth son for Jacob and she named him Issachar for she said, God has rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband as a wife. Then Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a sixth son and she named him Zebulun for she said, God has given me good reward. Now my husband will treat me with respect for I have given him six sons. Skip down to verse 22. Then God remembered Rachel's plight and answered her prayers by enabling her to have children and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. God has removed my disgrace and she named him Joseph for she said, may the Lord add yet another son to my family. You keep track of all that? It just sounded like a lot of maternity ward stuff. If you're keeping stats at home, that is 11 sons. That's a football team. 
I don't think they'd be any good, but that's a football team, right? And then we're gonna find out in Genesis 35, in a few chapters in the future, we're gonna find out there's a 12th son by the name of Benjamin. And it's important because these 12, right, become the 12 tribes of Israel that God uses to grow and develop the nation. It's also curious, right? How many disciples did Jesus have? 12, yeah, not, not a trick question. How many months are in the year? Oh, I think there's 12 days of Christmas too. Oh, you geek out on that later. That was just this fun. I thought that was fun. But here, what do you see here? What do you see in this story? It's a soap opera. I mean, if this were a film, right? If you were to take this section of Genesis and turn it into a movie, it would be rated R and my kids couldn't watch it. It's, it's crazy because it's messy. It's broken. This is not God's plan. This is not how God intended. This was not how he created it to be. Yet, in the mess, in the brokenness, in the dysfunction, in all of the jealousy and anger and all the crazy things going on, God keeps showing up. God is at work. And God has taken the brokenness and the messiness and he's turning it into something that he is going to do for good. See, God seems to do his best work in the mess. Why is that? God seems to do his best work in the brokenness. And some of you need to hear that today because you walked in these doors and you look good. But man, you're battling with an addiction and it's just beating you up over and over again. And some of you walked in those doors today and, and you just go, Greg, I just don't know, man, my marriage, it just feels like it's just holding on by a thread and I don't know what to do. And some of you walked in those doors today and your, your, your daughter or your son, they are just running as far away and you go, I just don't know what to do. And if we knew the thoughts that were in your heads, if we knew the struggles, if we knew the secret sins and the jealousy and the anger, it would be embarrassing. But the good news is God does his best work in the mess. God does his best work in the brokenness. In fact, if you study the story of God, can you name one woman or one man that God used to do something significant for him that wasn't a mess? Can you come up with one? I can't. I mean, Matthew, Matthew was a traitor. He was a tax collector. He was despised. And Jesus says, hey, bro, come follow me. And, and he begins to become a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And, and then when you open up the New Testament of, of God's word, the first account of the life of Jesus was written by this guy. Or Peter. I mean, Peter. I mean, he's a loud mouth. He, he's full of himself. I mean, you're a teacher. Peter's the guy you don't want in your room, right? He spends more time in the principal's office than he does in the classroom. I mean, this guy's got an answer for everything and it's always wrong. But yet God used Peter to take the gospel, the good news of Jesus beyond just the Jewish faith. Or Paul. He wasn't originally known as Paul. He was known as Saul. And who was Saul? He was arrogant. He was studied. He was in he was very intellectual. He was smart. He was trained in the best schools. He was full of himself. He was full of pride. And he turned that into persecution and into murder. He had blood on his hands. In fact, he wrote these words. After he found a relationship and encounter with Jesus, Paul wrote these words to the church in Ephesians chapter two, verse one. Hey, church, this is for you. He says, hey, as for you, he says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who were disobedient. Verse three, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature deserving of wrath. I love verse four. But God, but because of his great love for us, God, 
who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ when we were dead in transgressions. For it is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He says, oh, I was a mess. You were a mess. But God, in our mess, in our mess, he chose through his great love, because of his great love, he came to us and he, he chose to make us alive, the words he used, through the power and the transformation of Jesus Christ. And if you've been here the last few weeks, we've been talking about transformation, this idea of being changed from the inside out. And we've talked about the four steps of transformation or the transformation process. And the first step's awareness. The second step is resistance. The third step is deep change. And the fourth step is life on mission. And, and awareness. You know when awareness usually happens? In your pain. In your brokenness. A lot of people gotta hit rock bottom or you think it's rock bottom and they keep going deeper, right? But it's in that brokenness that you become aware that I am broken, that I am a mess. I am in need. And the second step is resistance. And this is where we've seen Jacob stuck for chapter after chapter. But the reality is this is the step that most of us get stuck in. Why? We can see the brokenness and we can see the mess, but we can kind of rationalize around that. But because we know that this step, resistance, it's hard to take the next step to do the work. It's hard work. It's just easier to settle for the status quo. It's just easy, it's okay, I'm okay, you're okay, and just settle for something less. But the problem is when we get stuck in resistant change and don't go to the next step of deep change is we settle for something less than God called you to be. See, God created you on purpose, with purpose, for a purpose. There's a reason you have the talents and the gifts and the abilities that you have. And when we get stuck, we settle for a lesser version than who God called us to be because the final step is this idea of life on mission. And when you get to this step, you're, you're getting not perfect, right? You're still in this idea of transformation, but you begin living the life that you were created to live. And oh, by the way, that life is not about you. It's not about me. It's about how we can serve and help other people. One of my best friends in the world it's a guy named Mike, and Mike lives in Miami. In fact, he lives on the beach. He's got a view of the beach from his condo. And Mike, kind of typical story, grew up Catholic. He knew about God, didn't really know anything about God. And like some of us, right, he would go to mass and do, go through the hoops and do the kneeler and do the things that you do. But he didn't really know God. And so Mike began to live the way that a lot of people live. He just began chasing the dollar, He's like, man, if I can just make a lot of money, then my life will be complete. But along the way, Mike got stuck, looped into drugs and then into alcohol, and he got looped into all kinds of things, and so his life began to fall apart. He cheated on his wife and uh, lost his marriage. He was addicted, but one day through a church similar to this, he, he heard for the very first time that there was a guy named Jesus. And that Jesus had, had died on a cross and taken all the sin and all the shame and all his junk on him and that he loved him. And so Mike, he surrendered his life to the authority of Jesus was baptized. And slowly but surely, God began to transform Mike's life. Now, if he were standing here right now, he'd be the first to go, I am nowhere near perfect. But here's the cool part. I got to witness this. Who's the best person to help an addict Who's the best person to help someone that's struggling in their marriage and their relationship? And so God took this guy in all his mess, in all his brokenness, and he began to transform it, and he began to redeem it. And I got to watch Mike. I got a front row seat to see him come alongside addicts and people who were addicted to drugs and alcohol and help them to find freedom. I got to see him come along marriages and families and people whose lives, their marriages were falling out, and come home and help restore it. I got to stand along the side of guy and see tons and tons of people baptized into their faith. Why? Because God took the mess, God took his brokenness, and, and through the power and the love of Jesus, he began to transform it. 
See, the reality is our choices have consequences. Right? We see it here in Jacob. <laughs> right? There's, there, are, there are consequences to having four wives. <laughs> it's not good. There are consequences to our decisions. And many of you today, you're in pain, you're struggling because you made bad choices. But at the same exact time as, as there are consequences, we do reap what we sow, there is also a God, right, who is faithful, that we serve a God who is faithful. See, I would have given up Jacob on Jacob, you're like, like, dude, you're done. I would have given up on him like chapters ago. But God never did. God never does. God never gives up on you, and he never gives up on me. See, this book, Prince Harry's book, it's entitled Spare. You know what spare is? Spare is a leftover. It's something that's unwanted or not needed. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel unwanted or not needed? I mean, look at them, Greg. Whoa, they're so talented and they're so gifted. Surely God can use them. Oh, look at her. Oh my goodness, surely God can use her, but me. But see, if Jesus is who he says he is, if Jesus really is the son of God, if Jesus really did come to earth, take on human flesh, teach and heal and love, if Jesus really died on a cross and took all our shame and sin on him, if Jesus really did go to the grave and come back alive, then, then you, no matter what you've done, then you, no matter where you've been, then you, no matter how far you feel, then you, no matter how broken or messed up you feel like your life is, you are never beyond the touch and the reach of Jesus. It's never too late. It's never too late. You're not too far. I mean, if Jesus really is who he says he is, if Jesus really did die, if Jesus really did come back to life, then your story, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, your story is not over told you I was going to come back to this. Genesis chapter 29, verse 35. Don't miss this. Genesis 29, 35. It says, once again, Leah became pregnant and gave birth to another son. And she named him Judah. For she said, now I will praise the Lord. And then he stopped having, and then she stopped having children. Judah. Fourth son from a wife he was not supposed to have. Judah, by the way, means praise or to praise. This is a bad situation, but God turns it to good. If you flip over to the New Testament, the second part of the Bible, Matthew chapter one, written by a traitor tax collector. Matthew chapter one, beginning in verse two, Matthew writes these words. In Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Judah. And he fast forward a few verses down to verse 17, and Matthew writes this. All those names, <laughs> all those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David and 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. Verse 18, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. What did he just do? He took a broken, messed up, jealous, angry, dysfunctional, terrible family through a wife he wasn't even supposed to have and not even the firstborn, but the fourthborn. And he took him and through his line, through his descendants, he redeemed and restored through the power and the name of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. See, there's hope. There's hope. And that's what we celebrate today. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how you feel, no matter what you're hiding, 
no matter how unwanted or unloved you feel, if Jesus is who he says he is, you are never beyond the hope and love of Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that today. I'm gonna invite you to stand with me and to take out your communion. Jesus gathered his disciples around a table and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my, my blood which is spilled out for you. Do this to remember me. And we need to remember today. Remember today that Jesus died for you. So we'll take the, the bread and this is my body which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. took the cup it's my blood which is poured out for you do this to remember me Jesus I pray over these these on these people in this room these students these parents every single person God you your chosen people God your sons your daughters I pray that everyone here would just today in a fresh way have an encounter with you, God, and know that you love them. I pray those who are just doubting, God, that you would just keep lobbing belief back at them over and over again. God, I pray for those who are discouraged today, God, who walked in here and they're down and they're discouraged. God, I just pray you'll just lob belief at them right now. God, I pray that, that those who, who feel like it's hopeless, who don't know the next step, God, just remind them there is so much hope because of Jesus Christ. God, may your truth, may your words just fill us. And not just our minds, God, not just our ears, but may it penetrate all the way down to our core and to our soul. God, there's hope because of you. And we can pray boldly because of the name of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.
and pull us apart we are joined as one by your blood and hope will rise as we become more than conquerors to the one who loved the world of his forever family. And I hope that you heard that crystal clear today. We know that life is messy. We know that the journey can be really challenging and we hope that nobody ever feels like they're on this by themselves. And so there's a group of us that are down here in the front of the service, at the end of the service, every week. And our purpose for being here is, is a couple of fold. Number one, some of you are going, what does it look like to be part of God's forever family? And we're here to help answer that question. And for others of you, you're going, I'm in a real mess and I'm looking for a little support, a little bit of prayer, and we're there for you. And some of you are going, I am ready to go on mission with Jesus and I would really like to know some guidance. I'd like to have some guidance on what that next step would look like. And we're here for you too. Basically, whatever it is that you're going through, that you're processing, come down here and uh, share with us. Let us pray and encourage you and maybe give you a couple of thoughts about where to go next. 
It's been a wonderful Sunday. I hope you've been blessed by Greg's teaching and the great, we're gonna have him on our team with us moving forward. That's gonna be a huge blessing. Uh, join us next week with Jason and uh, God bless you. Enjoy the extra day tomorrow. Take care. Thank you.